I'm Charlie Harp, and this is the Infermonster Podcast. This episode of the Infermonster Podcast is part two of our discussion with the folks from MITRE about the M Code and Codex initiatives. Joining me in this second part of that interview is Stephen Brott, Carmela Kuder, Sean Shakib, and Carol McUmber. In this part, we're talking about some of the complexities, challenges, and benefits of sharing data across the silos in healthcare. I think there's a, there's a couple of interesting forces at work, and, and we struggle against these in healthcare all the time. And one of them is exactly what you said, that we, we've evolved out of these silos. And so the idea of um, trying to do something collaboratively is, is still relatively new in healthcare. The second thing is the idea that as a provider, you know, they want the benefit of having um, computable data so that I can get real-time artificial experience or knowledge from other places incorporated into my workflow to enlighten me or make, make me aware of something I didn't know before. But to make that happen, I have to be part of a system where I'm putting in data that can be shared across the silos and usually, at least with the way we deal with terminologies today, there's a certain amount of lift um, that's involved. There's energy needs to be put in to capture the data in a structured way in the first place or in a way that I can easily structure so that I can share it so, so that we can work collaboratively. And I think the other moving part that I know we struggle with sometimes as a terminology catalyst, if you will, is that a lot of the traditional terminologies and codes and things that we use at least a handful of them are coming out of a very traditional publisher mindset, going from people that are used to writing books, reference books that people would use to practice and turning that into um, something that you can integrate into a, into a structured computable environment is another challenge. And also, you know, how, how that's, how that's dealt with from a, from a licensing perspective there's a lot of confusion about that and, 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 you know, where somebody's using it, where they're reusing it, um, how things are being transported. There's a lot of complexity. It's why when people who sit outside of healthcare kind of look at healthcare and roll their eyes and say, well, how hard could it be? We all know firsthand how hard it can be because we're dealing with all these competing forces. And it, it's really almost like pushing that big, you know, boulder up the hill to try to get to the point where we can we can take advantage. So I, I have a, a great deal of respect for all the things that you guys are, are are working to pull it all together. You know, we've we've had um, you know Steve brought up body site for for radiation. Um, some of the one of the code systems that's in use in common use today is. Um, maintained by the American Association of Physicists and Medicine that Steve brought up before, and it's called TG263. What's interesting, it's, so it's available, down, you can download the spreadsheet okay, for that. And so then I guess people are copying it into their implementations. So that brings up maintenance issues. But when you look at the, the codes in there and the names, it turns out that the names or the descriptions for the concepts that you might display they're really short and it turns out it's because the vendors that were using them um, had length limitations on their name. So this gets into the whole thing about reference terminologies versus say an interface terminology and can the clinicians in their workflow use terminology that's familiar to them, but you know, potentially behind the scenes, it's mapped to a standard that's you know, being communicated Absolutely. around that everybody kind of understands. That the local terminology and the normative terminology can make a big difference. The other thing that is, is a challenge for us is, and you talked about, you touched on it earlier. We want everybody to take advantage of things. We want to show them the benefit of things. But when we have code systems that are updated on an annual basis or a semi-annual basis, if there's a code you need and it's not there, and there's not an easy mechanism that allows you to create an extension or create something that you can incorporate into your processes, you can't wait for six months necessarily. And so, you know, we have a lot of those challenges also that, you know, how do, how do we reduce the latency so that we can take advantage of it? Because the problem we have, at least the problem I've seen, you know, I've been doing this as an engineer for 30 years is the consumers, the providers, the patients, the people in healthcare 
you only have so many chances to, to prove that you're credible and to prove that you can do something useful before they get kind of, they, they start to stop believing that you can actually do the things you're, you're trying to sell them on because you're saying, hey, I'm going to be able to help you in all these crazy ways and be able to shorten, you know, improve patient care and reduce the amount of time and effort. And that's what makes it worthwhile for them to do the additional work that they're going to have to do on their end to make it all happen. And so we've just got to be careful that, you know, we have systems in place where we can actually deliver on, you know, what we're saying. And, and, you know, that's where, you know, seeing you guys accomplish these things and seeing these things happen, it's good for the entire industry because it kind of, it kind of shows that if we collaborate, if we have uh, good normative terminologies, if we have good standard ways of communicating with each other, we can actually do some really cool things. And we're not just thinking that we can, we can actually demonstrate that we can, which, you know, the proof of the puddings and the tasting, they say. Right. And some of that demonstration might be years down the road. You know, when you think about registries and things like that, you know, being able to populate cancer registries in, in a standard way, it might take a while before we see yeah, tremendous right. benefit from that. One of, the, one of the questions I was going to ask, Carmela, is, you know, when you look at the different domains that you guys are dealing with in MCODE, I know that there are some domains, you know, and I would have thought body location would be pretty straightforward. And actually, I think I underestimated the complexity of it. But I know there are some domains that when we've worked with clients that we've kind of struggled looking for kind of an authoritative source of information. Because a lot of these like genomics, for example, genomic reporting is an area where, you know, I think there's there's still some uh, some ambiguity. But are there any areas domains that you find, you know, more troublesome than others in terms of trying to determine a good authoritative source of, of terminology? Uh, I think we've been able to find good sources, uh, like the Human Genome Variation Society, you know, SNOMED, of course, for the, for the clinical code systems. Yeah, I think we've been able to find sources. I it seems to me that the, the major issue is when a, a source doesn't cover 100% of your needs. And, you know, I'll, I'll go back to SNOMED. SNOMED started a few years ago adding a pre-coordinating laterality into some of their, their body sites. But they haven't finished that, and so it's not all of them. And what happens sometimes is people look at that and they say, well, gee, they have left leg, but they don't have left um, pinky finger or, you know, something like that. So we can't use it. So I think that we can find sources, but sometimes we can't find comprehensive sources that um, fit 100% of the needs. And it's that maybe people just don't know, well, gee, you can contact the the steward or the owner of that code system, and you can start a dialogue with them about, about adding something. Or sometimes you might need to use more than one code system to get what you need, like SNOMED and the NCI thesaurus. And sometimes people are hesitant to do that, or they're operating under a, a misconception that you can't define a value set where the concepts are drawn from more than one code system. Well, I mean, I, we had that happen in one of the codex use cases. And we said, well, sure, you can define a value set that way. I wonder how much, how much people sometimes don't want to lose ownership of, of, it, of it as well. Because right? when you start taking something, maybe they've been doing in radiology, radiation therapy for a long time. And then they say, well, we want to entrust this to SNOMED. There's, there's a, maybe there's some reluctance to do that. Um, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, that mindset, I mean, and, and part of it is just, you know, um, those of us, you know, who are entrenched in the HL7 world, I mean, often make, you know, try to make the assumption that the stuff that we're creating is going to be used by someone else, should be used by someone else, um, should be reusable, be defined in a way that people understand what we meant, you know, by this, you know, by these codes and this code system or this value set. Um, but, you know, as you guys have been talking about, that's not, you know, a native thing for a lot of people. You know, uh, maybe the answer is, you know, finding a way to make uh, resources within HL7, you know, more available to, to take some of that work on. 
instead of, you know, kind of relying upon people to, to have that in-depth understanding because it, it, it takes you know, a lot of time and a lot of experience to get it right sometimes. And you know, the researchers out there, the genomic experts, the, um, you know, the clinicians, you know, they're not, they're not um, as interested in the, uh, the gory guts of terminology, authoring and maintenance as we are. From my, my perspective, it's, um, it's the community, you know, it's getting a, the thought leaders together, the, the big organizations, thought leaders could come from any size organization, because they're key to scaling this up. You know, so I, I have no doubt we can produce a, a, a beautiful implementation guide. Um, and it's really critical that we do. I mean, hopefully the one we have is pretty good, but uh, it has to be used and adopted. And for that to happen, it has to be provide value. And uh, as it was mentioned before, it can't induce uh, undue burden, or at least uh, without increasing some substantial value for the people who have to collect the data too. So, so I think the, to, to me, it's the community getting the people together um, who are going to, are committed to, to run with it. Um, if it was just a MITRE research project, which it started off as, um, it would be unlikely to succeed. If you can continue to get more cancer centers saying they, they, they want it and to contribute their oncology expertise, if we can get more vendors saying, yeah, we want to help you <laughs> help you collect this stuff and share it, more, more uh, recipients of the data, whether it's places like the CDC or other registries or pharmaceutical companies and so on, uh, payers, the, the more we can get a community around these, what sound like a wide range of use cases, the bigger the community will be, the, the more important M code will be as a core that will lead to a real value down the road and success. But um, so I think that's the key is continue to build our community. Um, we're doing pretty well after a year, a little over a year of, of, of Codex uh, and M code itself being a little older, but um, it's, it's a, that's the biggest challenge, I think, honestly. This is kind of a high level question. I mean, what do you guys view as being sort of the single biggest challenge now to either, you know, further adoption or, you know, additional work, you know, to fully specify what's an M code? What, what do you view as your single biggest challenge today? Yeah, I guess I've, I've seen a challenge to explain to folks who are new to the space to define a value statement and also explain the standards process that you can participate as a community member and you you don't have to um, you know give up any of the special sauce for your company or anything like that you're you're contributing to the standard but you're you don't have to um, describe or expose anything that you do that's specific that makes your particular implementation special and and valuable to to the community so what we've seen a couple times when we have meetings with potential community members and Steve chime in is that sometimes the whole idea of participating in a standards organization is foreign to them and we, ha we have to get over that hump. One of the things we're trying to do in Codex at least as well is, is that we don't require everyone in Codex to to be, immer be immersed in, in the HL7 in process because I think part of the value we can provide is Okay, you you're good. At, you're an oncologist. You're good at oncology. You understand how 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 patients are treated and and uh, what the potential outcomes are from those treatments and uh, and so on. Let's leverage that expertise. We don't need to make you an HL7 process expert. If you want to, that's fine, and we'll we'll give you opportunity to do that. Same with even building implementation guys. We've got some wonderful tools we've developed, including Fire Shorthand, which is now being used by like a hundred different projects in the HL7 space. But um, I don't necessarily want every registry to become an expert on building implementation guides, but if they want to, you know, if they have some people they want to they want to get smart on how to do those things, that's also good. The same with terminology or any area. So I think it's another part of the community, I guess, really is bringing together the complementary expertise, expertises that are needed to succeed as well. Most of the people in Codex, I would say, Carmel is fair to say, are not at all HL7 insiders, but they're getting exposed to HL7 and want that to be a good, you know, good a good experience. Part of that will be kind of abstracting the, <laughs> making sure they don't have to go through every step of the process themselves, but that we we're working together and leveraging their expertise on the right in the right places. So, are there any other questions before we uh, we look at wrapping things up today? Anything else you guys want to want to put out there? 
I guess I'd ask what's the what's the future of, of M code? I mean, what's next, I guess? Well we're hoping to um the, I mentioned the this do to um balloting coming up and we'll certainly get some more comments and hopefully if we're successful we can freeze that as, as a as a stew to not just draft but stew to um by uh sometime in the third quarter of the year um, we'll see how, how the comments look uh and we have a lot of comments from internally coming in from our codex community even so that's that's good though um if i would hope that at some point we can go come normative whether it's on the next following stew two or, or, or stew three because we want to make it make something that's relatively stable for the community, especially for vendors to count on things that can't can change out from underneath vendors or, or, or providers or um, uh, on a monthly basis, get some stability. So I'm hoping we have enough experience and good input that we can kind of freeze that and then it becomes a core that's relatively stable and we can build out these other implementation guides for these specific use cases. They may include additional data elements and you know, additional profiles, maybe extensions that are not in M code. Um, it may turn out there's parts of M code that aren't right, but we're not going to change them because they're normative. We'll, we'll create a, some kind of a supplement. Um, so that's all to be seen, how, how these use cases play out, these projects that are, people are working on and, and real experience. A dream would be that we've got a, a critical mass of, of, of customers asking for M code and, and of vendors that are delivering it and that we can help them. That we, we can help them as a community go faster uh, if that's what they want. I'm really hoping even that this this year we'll start we're, we're starting to touch patients already too. This is where it gets we, you know, we talk a lot about standards and technologies, but already in our on our real world data uh, project, I care data, it's called. We're hoping to have over 150 patient encounters for which M code data will be collected uh, this year as part of three trials or three to six trials, depending if we, if we get some more at 20 different health systems. Um, we are already enrolled six patients in our clinical trials matching pilot for what's called phase just phase one of the pilot. So they'll start hopefully experimenting with are they able to find trials that match their 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 needs quicker and faster? Uh, looking at the, even the user interface, making sure that's that that makes sense. You know, can they get their data out of their EHRs into the into these systems and send off to different matching services and get back some coherent set of matches with goodness of fit that they can make choices with with on their own or with their oncologist. So that's a, a really important part of the future is where we're really, we're not just testing and piloting, but we're, we're really Im improving the care and uh, research for cancer patients. Steve, is another um, item that we have started to touch on in MCODE and CODEX, but is the, the fact that right now MCODE is a US realm implementation guide. And there's a lot of interest outside of the U.S. in M-Code. And the fact that the M-Code profiles, say, for procedure or cancer patient, some of the observation profiles, they're based on uh, U.S. core profiles. You know, it's probably something that, um, you know, I don't know if it would be a separate project or whatever, but I can see an M-Code's future um, moving it more towards the universal realm or having a version of it that is the universal realm versus the U.S. realm. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I think that's really important. Given all your experience, do you have any idea what kind of effort would be required to do that, to go to the universal realm? Well, I think we'd probably have to do an examination of what restrictions um, having the U.S. core profiles as our base be. And one that I can think of in other, it's only in the United States that say race and ethnicity are required for a patient. So I, I know at least one of those U.S. core requires. So, you know, folks say in Switzerland would say, well, gee, we don't require that for a patient. But since that's one of the M code profiles, you know, and technically in FHIR, you can't uh, relax a constraint you, you can only add constraints when you build a profile. So, uh, you know, that's one very simple example, but um, even the staging um, systems, you know, there's AJCC, is that used outside of the US? I don't know, because there's also UICC, which is another staging system. There's so there's it would just, oops, sorry. Okay, Cameron, I was gonna say there's also, 
even if you look at some place like the NHS in the UK, I mean, they have a, a different terminology for imaging and radiology procedures over there as well. That's actually pretty robust compared to what we have here in the U.S. I would imagine that when you go from region to region, there's going to be some, you know, code system variability. And then there's the obvious um, language situation. When you go outside of SNOMED or even within SNOMED, there can be some language challenges. But you're right. I mean, cancer is a universal problem. It's not just something we struggle with here in the U.S. Kamala said we've had uh, interest in, in, in discussions with with groups in Brazil, and uh, we have active participation from people in Switzerland and France and Germany. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be a, that's a really great great observation, though, Carmela. We we do need to put that on our our agenda for the next year to consider internationalization. All right. Well, hey, um, one of the things I wanted to make sure I said is when we first found out about MCODE, I know a lot of folks on my team were. We're really excited to see it. Obviously, cancer is, is, is a non-trivial issue, and it's the kind of thing where you would think that if we could get good data from across all the silos, that we could, we could see patterns that could help us make a meaningful impact on you know, where we route patients, how we treat patients, and what we can learn about, about the disease. So uh, we're really excited to see MCODE. We're really excited to be a part of MCODE and to support you guys. And, uh, and we'll have some more information in the links. Uh, any last words before we, uh, we call it? Well, thanks for giving us the opportunity to share what the community is doing. And certainly welcome any of your listeners to contact us. Um, and and uh, we'd love to have a conversation about where you might engage. Well, thanks. Ditto. Absolutely. Well, I want to say thank you to uh, Steve, Carmela, and, and thanks to Carol and Sean for joining me today on the InfraMonster podcast. I really appreciate all the information and uh, look forward to the next one. Thanks, you guys.